that part of what drew you to this script and to Spoon? Or? It, yeah, well, in a way, because I felt like, well, upon my release, I felt like I wanted to be seen as a complete human being. I'm through, um, like, mimicking characters for people so that they can get a better understanding on what young black males are about. I want to mimic whole characters so that I can get a better understanding on what men and human beings are about. So now it's like I don't care about making people understand how we are. That's what I used to do. Every part was just about digging deeper into who young black males are, and I felt like I was an actor that could do that. I'm not interested in that. And Spoon is my first venture into breaking off into that new philosophy as far as it being um, not all sad, not violent, um, not all serious, you know, and it's funny. To somebody who just hears what, that I'm a heroin junkie, they'll think, oh, it's just the same thing. But that's part of the love that I, that I get when I see them see the movie and they go, oh, you know, and then it's a heroin addict like you've never seen. It has so much, well, it's really got a lot of realism in it because, I mean, in real life, you're in a horrible situation, something funny happens, yeah. and it's so funny. Yes, and that's what I like. And we're like, um, it's like, we always joke, me and Tim, that it's an action movie. We're action stars now, we're running and stuff. And if you look at us, we look like the two most unlikely action stars in the world. So it's like, we're the new, we always joke, like we're the new um, Danny Glover and Mel Gibson. I'm the Mel Gibson, he's the Danny Glover. And that's part of the whole thing now. We just, it's fun for us to do this because he's not used to, the, to this and I'm not used to this. Well, he's, an, he's like an actor's actor, so he's done every part. You know, Tim has played an ice cream cone, you know what I mean? But I haven't played a lot of different parts, so it's fun to, when I do do this, to do it with him. You know what I mean? It makes me feel comfortable and I can take his criticisms and his praises more seriously knowing that he knows what he's talking about. Because usually I wouldn't give credit to another actor like, what does he know? but him I can respect. Let's just talk about Spoon for a minute because he's such a, an interesting character. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess, you know, tell us like a little bit of his adventure that he goes on. Spoon. He is a man who's found, who hasn't found that peace yet. You know how they say you, you're born and you go through things and then you go through this big catharsis and you change. Well, he's going through things. He hasn't yet found a door to change. So he's like in his mid twenties, going to his late twenties and still hasn't done anything with his life except get high and, you know, be into this music thing. So, and, and he's always been like a take. I took, I got to take things from this person, take things from that person. But with Stretch, he's given, it's like I'm his guardian and I think that Spoon is scared to move away or walk away from Stretch because then he'll know how empty his life truly is and how he's really nowhere. So to me, it's, that's good because it talks about a need for friendship and it talks about the bond that our friendship is about. Not only me and Stretch, but Sh Stretch and I and Cookie, you know what I mean? The bond that we all share. So that's what I think. You start, the Spoon is the one that, that decides that you guys should quit. You know, no. And you keep like pulling and stretches like going back to mud and getting into trouble. And he represents euthanasia, you know, to die slowly, to die um, painlessly. You know what I mean? That's his character is euthanasia. And my character is reality because I don't want to die. So when it comes to that point where we get to the door, we either die, you know, we got to take that big chance. Stretch has no problem taking that chance because he feels as though he's already dying. So it's to die slow, you know what I mean? It's to die painlessly. Whatever fun we can have on the way is what he wants to do. Whereas with me, it's like I don't want to die. And so I'm constantly getting us out of this drama that he puts us in. That's a law, yeah. That's a law. You learn that in acting class. They pass out cigarettes. <laughs> um, I know you've done some acting before, you know, like three or four movies. Was it something that always interested you? Was it like a natural outgrowth of performing? I believe. Rap is like more, like it's like performance music. But what it truly is, is I've always been an actor. 
and rap music, the reason I've been successful in the rap game, I think, is that I treat my albums like movies and I treat writing it like I'm a character writing a story, you know, for each album, whatever I'm going through, whatever stages I'm going through. And I do it vividly with vivid pictures, with action and description and a beginning, middle and an end and conflict and, you know, redemption and things like that. So I feel like I've always been an actor and acting is my first love. I went to school of performing arts. I studied. I wanted to be an actor. But due to the poverty and the natural circumstances that stopped me, like being poor and homeless and all of that, I never got a chance to leisurely study acting with great teachers and, you know, fine tune my craft. What I did do, though, was throw myself into the streets and learn as many experiences as I could. So now that I have the opportunity now to relax, exhale, and actually um, work on the craft, I have so many things to draw from. And it makes it where I'm comfortable now with this, where I wasn't doing those other movies. It was just like a hobby. Now I'm an actor, and I, want, I don't want anybody to take that from me and say, you're a rapper who's acting because you would hardly pay me this, and you would hardly get these scenes that you're getting if I was a rapper just acting, you know what I mean, for the check. So I'm an actor. I just happen to rap on my spare time instead of being a waiter. Do you think part of the reason you've been so incredibly successful as, as a rap artist also is that you create, like your songs create a complete character that you kind of put out there? Yeah, I think that um, with my music, it's like watching somebody go through things my whole career. And I feel like it's like if James Dean was a rapper, it'd be me. You know what I mean? Or if Marilyn Monroe was a rapper, it'd be me. If the person who you who you can um, just watch go through crazy drama and just, you know, you could either cry, laugh, cheer, or whatever, but it's not happening to you, it's happening to them. And I'll tell you vividly, because I don't know that you're not supposed to tell people everything that happens in your life, so I just tell them. And that's what I think has made me successful, if, if anything. And now has it become kind of like larger, you know, Bondi was talking about like being with you on the set and reading the papers that you're out like doing stuff. Yeah, and I'll like, be right there. That Yeah, it is that. And that's what's, um, I guess, that's what's uh, frustrating and aggravating that I can't live down this big shadow that I made to protect myself. Because it started out as just being, I need to get an alter ego to keep people away from me and to protect myself, which everybody does. You know, like when somebody breaks into your house, and you know he's in the house, you wouldn't go in your real voice, excuse me, are you breaking the miles? You would go, hey, what you doing miles? It's the same thing that I do, you know what I mean? If you're out in the wilderness and I'm just one sheep by myself, I wouldn't go. Um, I want to say my next song, um, it's called, uh, I would go, you know, ooh, fuck the world, you know what I mean? And that's, that's, that's worked, you know what I mean? And not that it's like a total facade, it's, it's, it's me, but it's just blown up. And what the media does is, if you ever want to see anger, just he's the best actor in the world, and he'll show it to you. So, so that's what they do, and make it look like I'm just any guy in America when I'm an actor who's just playing this part so well that I look very angry. You know, not that I'm such a great actor, but anger is easy. Everybody gets mad, everybody's frustrated, and everybody is fed up. So it's not very, it's not a very hard part to play. You know. No, you created like something that was like. Yeah, too good because now they're <laughs> now they're using it. I mean, it's it's I'm, I've made Bob Dole and Dolores Tucker into household names, you know, along with some of the other rappers, and I've made a lot of people. I made politicians, you know, figure out what it is they do for a living. You know what I mean? And that's good in a way, but it's bad in a lot of ways. I, I, we always wanted to spark debate. We always wanted to be noticed, but never wanted it to be this way. Where now all we've been shouting about all this time is better laws and more respect and all the shouting all this is doing now is getting laws changed so that we can't shout about it no more and we get less respect anyway so it's frustrating to see this demon that not only the media has created but i've taken responsibility for helping to create that but um it's just like any full-blooded all-american guy when you're in high school you're the party animal then you want to grow up but what if you was in high school all your life and nobody wanted to see you go from the party animal to the student or the scholar? You know, it's just too much fun because what it is is they don't have a party animal who's as good as I am, who's as articulate and fun to watch and charismatic. You know what I mean? That's what they actually say and that's how they actually feel. It's not me jocking myself, but that's how they feel. It's like, oh, he's the best villain because at least we can hear what it is we don't like. He's saying it clear, but if you thought about it, I'm hardly the villain. I'm hardly the one you should be scared of. It's the guy that can't talk. It's the guy without a job. It's the one with scars on his face, not the one clean cut. 
You know what I mean? You should be worried about a lot of other things, but not me. It's interesting because you kind of have, Spoon is kind of uh, artistically a way out for you, and Spoon is looking for. No doubt. He is a way to help my image, and I am a way for him to, um, it, my life has been, has made it easy for me to jump into Spoon because all I have to do is think, where would I be if I stayed on those paths? And I would be Spoon because he's articulate, talented, he's just a junkie, you know what I mean? So where would I be had I not took these chances, had I not gone all out, had I not done the things that made me into a monster in the media's eyes? I would be spooned. I would still be a, a, a very talented human being that no one knew about, that no one interviewed, that no one gave movie parts to. So whatever I do, good or bad, you know, it's got me out of where I was. It's got me out of the jaws of death. So now that I'm out of the jaws of death, I don't mind all the foggy breath from the people who don't like what I said to get out of there. I'm just happy I'm not there anymore. And what I say is like, it's like when you see, you know, it's, it's kind of hypocritical because people love to, you know, have mercy and sympathy for everything from the animals to the whales to fur to everything except us, your youth, the ones who you give no attention to who become adults with no compassion. You know what I mean? And I feel like if you walk by a street and you was walking on concrete and you saw roads growing out of concrete, even if it had messed up pedals and it was a little, you know, to the side, you would marvel at just seeing a rose grow through concrete. So why is it that when you see some ghetto kid grow out of all of the dirtiest circumstances and he can talk and he can sit across and you make you smile, make you cry, make you laugh, all you can talk about is my dirty rose, my dirty stems and how I'm leaning crooked to the side. You can't even see that I came up out of that shit. And that's exactly the analogy that it is for me. You know what I mean? I should probably get back to what uh, we do for a minute, though. Oh, yeah, a movie. We're doing one. Yeah. <laughs> That'll be the next one. <laughs> <laughs> nah. That's good. Um, what about working with Bondi? Did you know him before? or you know? How I had saw him, him before. I had saw things he did. And um, once I met him, I was open to working with him. He wasn't tripping off me, and I wasn't tripping off him. There was no ego thing. It was just good to work with somebody and get direction from somebody who didn't um, bring baggage along. I felt like he never knew what was going on. Like, and I was telling him, like, yeah, I got to go to court. He was like, huh? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I got to do this. Huh? Like, he didn't know what was going on. It's just like, yeah, just be at work. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I liked that. It made it comfortable for me. It took a lot of pressure from me. Instead of usually when I meet directors, they're like, uh, uh, hi. You know what I mean? <laughs> so. Talked a little bit about it, but uh, can you talk a little bit more about your relationship with Tim Roth and, and, um, and what it's like working with him? It's fun. It's, it's, I always joke and say I'm training him, but really he's teaching me, you know, not teaching me as far as, you know, listen, watch this, but teaching me as far as watching him. It gives me confidence to do what I'm doing. Because first I was intimidated. Like, you know, here's this guy trained and learned, and he's who they think is one of the best actors, who I also think that. But I mean, as far as Equally across the board, everybody loves him. Everybody thinks he has talent. And I didn't study that way. I didn't study at all, really, if you don't count high school. So I look at it as being like, when he tells me, like, you know, oh, yeah, I felt you, then I know that even though I didn't study like he studied, that I'm getting the same result. It gives me confidence. I can work with anybody now, and I wouldn't be, you know, like, well, what do you think? I would be totally comfortable because that was the last puzzle. It's like, you know, I know I'm good to my people. I know I'm good to my folks all the all of my peers love me, you know, my generation. But if he can say, yeah, you're on the right track, that's right, as long as you do this. You know what I mean? His thing is like methodical, by the book. You know what I mean? It's like he gets there by a certain path. And mine's is like, just close your eyes, and when it's time to turn the camera on, put yourself in that position. You know the character and do what he would do, like fresh. You know what I mean? So it's the opposite. But it's fun. It's, it's, it, it's, it's like riveting to be there and why he's doing his and I'm doing mine and then we get the scene right, I know we're on the right track. It makes me comfortable and gives me confidence. Are you excited for all your fans to see you? Yeah. I'm excited for both of our fans. I'm excited for the movie theater owners. I'm excited for the sight it'll be in that theater when, when people who come to see my movies come and people who come to see Tim's movie come and Vondi's friends come and, you know, Tandy's friends come, people want to hear the soundtrack come, and they all be in the theater, like, hey, did you see the, you know what I mean? Did you see who's back there? You know what I mean? It's going to be that type of a theater all over America. 
that's what I'm happy about. I bet you it's more comedy in the theater than it is on the screen, just from all those different types of people being in one spot together. And that's what's real good. That's what movie making is about. Because acting really is not, a, um, it's not saving the world. We're just making them feel good while we all go through the motions. So that's what's dope, is that we can put us all in that one spot, especially at this time in the history of where we are in America and the country and the world. It would be good to get us all in there, some happy shit. No murders, no racism, just happy shit, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm sure some people are going to go, oh, it's like a black guy and a white guy that are friends, and they it has nothing to do with it. It never comes, it's never like that. I mean, and people are going to trip because Tim is saying nigga, and I'm calling him a white boy, but it, it like, what we try to do is like, take, take the alcohol off the wound, you know what I mean? Like, once somebody keep hitting the wound like this 30 times, I mean, somebody can say nigga in the theater and they're gonna laugh at it because we just turned it into a comedy, you know what I mean? We just turned it into this innocent white boy who thinks that saying nigga will get him accepted because he hears all the black guys say it. And we turned it into black guys just realizing, you know, what we say and and how a white boy is just as harmful, saying honky and all of that shit hurts them just as much as nigga hurts us. We don't even realize it until, when you see the movie, you'll see how it just, all of us just bounce the word off so casually in the streets that we don't realize it. Um, it's also kind of cool that they're, you know, on, on the surface, like you'd say, oh, they're two junkies, they're like, whatever, whatever. But they're just like these two great guys who you really like, and they have so much humanity, you know, that I think for audience goers who would be like, Right. Hey, they're just like two guys who right. make it through the system. You've got to get, you've got to get your license at the DMV. You have to go little take. We are like junkies, like how people have to have coffee every morning. That's the type of junkies we are. How you know someone likes chocolate, or how like some women like being with guys who beat them up, or we have addictions. You know what I mean? It's not like junkies as far as um, we just like fucking our lives off, excuse me. It's like more like we have addictions, you know what I mean? And we just go through these addictions. Well, they're now at the point too where they just need to, uh, they're not getting high really, they're just like staying level almost right. too. Being numb, anesthetizing ourselves to the world. Because if they stop. And we all do that, stop. and everybody does that. That's why no one's gonna trip off the fact that we're junkies. They're gonna just think we're them. And have you had a lot, well, I don't know if I want to ask this question, but like dealing with the bureaucracy, which these guys certainly have, and you've had some dealings with the bureaucracy. I'm so <laughs> in tune to this. I've done so much research. Um, uh, <laughs> I've done it, so much involuntary research on the bureaucracies of the American government that I'm an expert. I'm also a consultant on the film for it. So it's like that. I know every, you know, I know all the runarounds. And I'm going to court now for things that I did when I didn't have any hair on my face, you know what I mean? It's just, that's how it goes. Um, what about the three, the three characters, Spoonstretch and Cookie? What's the dynamic going on there? It, I think, I bet you Bondi didn't think this, but I think that it's like a, it personifies our relationships as far as human beings out there right now, as far as like, um, that's how we are now. Like no one's sexual preferences are outlined definitely anymore, and relationships are not outlined definitely anymore. Marriage is not such a serious, stable thing like this anymore. I'm sure Mr. Dole and Ms. Tucker would like it to be that way, but it isn't. People are more like into just discovering and exploring relationships and seeing where it leads them instead of labeling them and then, you know, living that part. They're more like just being together and then after 10 years you realize you've been together and you're living in a relationship with two girls and two guys, you know what I mean? It's, so it's like that. We jump in the middle of this relationship that's been going on for a while and it's me, Stretch, me, Spoon, loving Cookie and loving Stretch, not sexually, but as a friend, as a best friend. And it's Stretch loving me as a best friend and loving Cookie. Um, sexually but not physically you know what I mean it's like that intense desire to be with her but because he loves her so much as you'll see in the movie he can't be with her that's something that'll keep him apart have you had um, a, a friend like stretch have you had that kind of like really mm -hmm. I had a friend named John Cole who was blonde and had hair down to his shoulders and had blue eyes and looked like you know America's vision of the perfect guy but he was all tore up inside because of things that happened in his life. 
and he was curious, like Stretch. And I was all tore up inside at the time that we met. And we met and he had money and I didn't. And he put me through high school. That's how I got through the School of Performing Arts. He snuck me up to his house so his parents didn't see. I spent the night there and we went to school. And I dressed in his clothes and, because it was fun for him to not have. And it was fun for me to have, you know what I mean? It was fun for him to hear rap music blaring out the speakers and it was fun. It was fun for me to show it to him. It was fun for me to hear um, Sting and to hear like that the Beatles had put things on the end of their records and then, and to know all of these like historic things about music that I never knew, that I would never have known had we not crossed paths. That has really defined who I am as an artist today and the diversity that I can choose from today and, and what I would play in my car today and what would make me stand out is from that union. So Stretch is that, I know it, I know him, you know what I mean? And it has nothing to do with black or white, it has to do with curiosity and, and just being mixed up, you know, having the cultures mixed up and watching what happens when it happens. This is how it should be, I think, in the world. You know what I mean? Everybody should get a partner. You show them your hood, you show them your hood, and that's your guardian, you know what I mean? Bet you we have a lot less problems. What's going on with keeping your music? What are you, what are you doing right now? Well, I'm approaching the six million mark on my album. All Eyes on Me, I'm working on the soundtrack for this movie. I'm working on my next project is a group called The Outlaws. It's my, my little cousins and little badass kids that I got in school and promised I'd put a project out for. Um, after that, I have a girl from London named Shell, whose song is going to be on the project, who sings, and I'm going to produce her album and break the barrier on what Tupac can do. And, Started a production company, working on some movies of my own. Just want to push forward. Do you? Okay. Oh, do we have to do it? Sure. Yeah, just talk about the sound for this movie. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, Death Row is going to do the soundtrack. We got Nate Dogg doing this beautiful song called Never Leave Me Alone, singing with Snoop Dogg rapping on it. Snoop has given me a song called Street Life. It's him rapping. I do a guest appearance. It's the bomb. It got this. Um, reggae guy chanting on it. And then we got Shell with Ball Time, straight out of London. I flew out here, got the song. Um, we have Damien's wife doing the song, one of the producers. Um, everything but the girl, um, a lot of things. Like it, now it's like everything is stuck on my own. We're doing a lot of old, we're doing a lot of covers, like um, old songs done over. Danny Boy's gonna do Change, gonna come. Six Feet is doing a song called Consider Me. It's one of the best songs ever made. I'm glad to be a part of it. They always talk about misogynists and all of that. These guys are doing a song about a guy talking about, you know, why do women always want the guys with money and the guys that are rude to them? Why don't they ever want, like, the pudgy guy who stays at home that'll teach a kid how to play basketball and stuff, stuff like that. So it's a good soundtrack. It's diverse, as, diver as diverse as the cast. Guarantee you the shake, and we're doing it like volume one and volume two. Volume one is the soundtrack for the movie, volume two is just all like the atmosphere for the streets. It's all like the rap and the R&B and the thugs. And then volume one is like the mix of everything.